Hi, welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman, and today we have a wonderful guest, Becca Laurie, who is the director of GRASP, which is Global, Regional, Asperger's, and she's going to tell you the rest of what it stands for. <laughs> and uh, I'm very glad, and um, Becca herself has Asperger's, so welcome to the show, Becca. Thank you, Hacky. It's a pleasure to finally be able to do this with you. We've known each other kind of in and out, and it's really a good time to be able to support what you're doing with different brains. I love it. Well, we want to support what you're doing with GRASP, and I, I think the best place to start is to tell us the story of your diagnosis, because you were not diagnosed for a long time. No, I was not. Um, I did not get diagnosed until I turned 36. Um, I had been in and out of having misdiagnoses most of my life, um, and it was uncomfortable. I lived kind of a suffering life. It was not pleasant. It started in school uh, very early on. I had a very high IQ, a very high reading level, but I struggled in math. And at that time, the New York City public school system didn't understand how you could be good at one thing, but not good at something else. Um, and so I was, they took somebody who could read at a college reading level in third grade and put me with a reading tutor. That was the solution. <laughs> uh, so I kind of got diagnosed with a uh, multitude, which is sort of the story for many adults on the spectrum. I got diagnosed well, let's, with... Well, let's back uh, up a little bit in the following yeah. sense. Sure. I'm learning more and more something. My daughter, Rebecca, by the way, you have a wonderful name, Becca. Thank you. Um, <laughs> who's been trying to teach me for years. I mean, she was not diagnosed till after she got her discrete math degree from Georgia Tech and had different diagnoses. But uh, she also had other issues as well. But she's been telling me for years and now more and more in the interviews I'm doing with Tanya Marshall, the author of Aspian Women and, and all that, that um, there's a reason for that in the sense that, well, multiple reasons actually, and I'd like at this point in your narrative for you to say, why is it that women can kind of fake it better than guys and kind of can be mistaken more easily for neurotypical or other labels? I'm going to say that's a twofold answer. It's not so much that we can fake it. Um, it's that our phenotype is different, meaning that the way that the autism expresses itself in women versus in men is distinctly different. Um, and because of society, it's not noticed. So as a little girl, I was always opinionated and I always had a big mouth. But when I was in school, I was the girl who was sitting in the corner reading. And the majority of girls who grow up on the spectrum without a diagnosis sit in a corner during you know, recess or during classes. And they're sitting there quietly, not bothering anybody with their face stuck in a book. And everyone says, oh, what a good girl she is. She doesn't bother anybody. She's reading a book. And you get all of these compliments. Whereas the male phenotype tends to be more aggressive, more vocal, more behavioral. And so it's squeaky wheel gets the grease. And, you know, that tends to be, I think, why girls get misunderstood or misdiagnosed for something else than what it is that's going on for them. Well, that's great. Then now let's rejoin <clears throat> your story. So you're growing up, you're being misdiagnosed, you're being mishandled Correct. in the schools. And then what happens? So uh, I, it is not by coincidence that I turned 18 in 1994 when Asperger's syndrome hit the books. So I was literally an adult the year that Asperger's syndrome hit anything. So there was nothing my teachers would have known to do, nor any of the clinicians that uh, my mom was taking me to. Um, and as I be went into college, um, I didn't think I was a college student. I thought I was really stupid. I had been told by my teachers that I was stupid because I learned differently. I was told and bullied actually by my teachers more than anybody else. Um, and I really, I left saying, I'm not a college student. What am I gonna do with my life? I have to be like a mechanic or something. I can have to do something with my hands. Like I'm not somebody who's an academic, um, partially because we don't test well. Um, and what ended up happening was I went to a community college just to kind of make my parents happy. And at community college, I had straight A's, and I, I had a professor there 
who is an ex-Harvard professor who is teaching at a community college for fun. And he said, you don't belong here. You belong in real school. You belong in a, in a four-year school. Go get your bachelor's degree. And I did do all of that. And I was very successful within that very tiny environment that many, this is, you know, college is half life. It's almost life, but not real life. And I did very well there. <clears throat> and then I finally said, okay, I should really address whatever's going on for me. And my last diagnosis prior to Asperger's was actually early onset schizophrenia. <laughs> oh boy! Um, yeah, I went to a, a clinician and I said, okay, I'm going to be honest with this person, even though I've been burned so many times in the past. I said, I'm going to tell her everything that's going on. And what I literally said to her was, my brain is very, very, very busy. It's very loud. It's very busy. And there's always a lot of conversations happening at the same time. And she said, oh, I hate to tell you this, but you have early onset, onset schizophrenia. Now, as somebody who's been reading for a very long time, I first of all said, that's not schizophrenia inside my head. And I said, it's also not early onset anything, because if I had gotten it in my 20s, it wouldn't be early onset schizophrenia. So I said, well, thank you very much, but I disagree. And I walked out. And I said, okay, I don't trust the medical profession anymore. And I certainly don't trust psychiatrists and I'm out. So I went about living my life the best that I could, which was a series of jobs that I would succeed at, crash, burn, start a new job. So I did 13 jobs in 15 years. What was the crash burn? What did that um, consist it would, of? Uh, most of the time I would do something that I had never done before. I would interview well enough to um, make them decide that it was a job I could do. So one of the first ones was in commercial construction. And I then got promoted to be a project manager. And as a project manager, um, I was running these huge commercial job sites in Manhattan, Verizon and, and companies like that. Um, and then eventually the people who'd been doing it for a lot longer than me and were a lot older than me got angry and jealous. And I got bored because it was easy for me. And I started to pay attention to the social conversation that happens in a workplace. And because I struggle with social conversations, I would get frustrated and I was always somebody who would notice that was going on and say, well, I'm going to quit before they fire me. And I would quit because something, some trigger triggered me off and I would tell people off and I'd quit and I'd walk out the door. Um, so now you, you're 36 when you finally get your diagnosis. Yeah. How did that come about? Um, well, uh, starting at about, I'm going to say 32 or 33, I had done another one of those cycles with a job. Um, ironically, I was a bartender and it was the best job I ever had. I loved it. And uh, they it, wanted to make it. me a hold manager. It. Hold it. Bartender, <laughs> no, here it is. <laughs> which probably involves reading a lot of social cues. Yep. And a lot of socialization. Yep. You loved it and you felt at home. Explain to me why you think that was. Okay, to me, it's a really, really simple, simple thing. People imagine that you have to read social cues and you have to um, constantly be having conversations and it's the way that it's portrayed in the movies. But the truth is, as a bartender, you serve somebody their drink and at a certain point, everybody gets drunk and they no longer even do their own social cues correctly. <laughs> but <laughs> also, you have this big giant piece of wood between you and the people that you're serving. And so if I feel like walking away, I'm done with the social or I don't know what's going on. All I have to say is, I'm sorry, I have a customer down there I have to take care of, I'll be back and walk away. I get to control the social situation. And I also get to create the personal boundary with the piece of wood between me. So because of that, it was I was in control of the entire social interaction all the time. So for me, it was extremely successful until they decided that they wanted me to, to be the bar manager. And that's when it all went, because now I'm not just responsible for myself, I'm now responsible for the other employees. And if anything goes wrong within the bar itself, so you're constantly running around. And at that point, it was anxiety, 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 anxiety. And I just said, I can't do this anymore. And I, and the hours were, I mean, I did them because the hours were good to me. I'm a night person, I'm not a morning person. Um, I was never in rush hour traffic. I was always doing reverse transportation to everybody else, but I became exhausted. It becomes an exhausting routine to be opposite of the world and the times that they're running. 
And I just said, I'm done and I'm leaving. And I just literally left. I said, I, I can't do this anymore. And I quit. And I went into my, at the time I had moved back to my mom's house and I moved, went into my bedroom and I said, mom, I'm not leaving the bedroom. And so that was at about 32, 33 and got into my bed, got into my pajamas, grabbed my cats and said, I'm not leaving my room, closed my bedroom door. And for three years, I laid in my bed. I said, clearly I'm going, I'm not meant for success. I'm not meant for this world. I'm broken. Nobody can figure out what's wrong with me, but I know something's wrong with me. I know I'm not a good enough person to be out there in the world. I don't have anything to offer. I mean, so much negative self-talk. Um, and after years of doing that, you know, I was extremely suicidal and that's something that I've only recently started to share with people because it took me a while to process through myself. Um, and I was very, very suicidal. And my mom at one point had reached a point where she said, if you just, if you really want to kill yourself, go ahead and do it because wow. I don't, I can't see you this miserable. Like you are so, you don't, you never leave the house and I can't see it. And I said, well, I don't do it because I don't want you to find my dead body. I can't imagine anything sadder than being a parent, finding their child's dead body. So for three years, we lived in this. Um, I had had migraines my whole life and I had a change in my migraines or what used to be the auras of my migraines. Um, they were always visual beforehand and then all of a sudden I was getting a smell. So immediately I was said to myself, well, okay, clearly something's going on. My mom didn't smell the smell. I only smelled the smell. So I started journaling how often, what it smelled like, trying to describe it, all kinds of stuff. Um, went to my neurologist, nothing was wrong all of these things. Um, but what I ended up on was WebMD because that's the source for all information that is verified. <laughs> and I was looking for olfactory hallucinations at that point, ha no, having heard the word schizophrenia before. I was looking for any kind of brain tumor that might be affecting my olfactory system. Um, and I wasn't satisfied with what was on WebMD. So I went to the better source, which is Wikipedia. Everybody knows Wikipedia has the answers to everything. <laughs> and I went on there and I was looking it up and I uh, managed to get myself to sensory processing disorder. And as I read about that, I said, well, this is really familiar to me. I do, I'm very sensitive to smells and tastes and, you know, touch and all of those things, but especially light. I said, this is very interesting to me. Maybe this is what's been going on my whole life. Well, hmm. And I get to the bottom of the article and there's a link to Asperger's syndrome. And I said, I've never heard of this Asperger's syndrome thing, but now I could possibly have a syndrome. So <laughs> let me know what's going on. So I clicked on it um, and I read it through and I can only describe it in two ways. It was first like reading my own biography as if I had written the entire entry myself. And then it was also as I was reading it, my body physically felt the connection to it. Uh, it felt like when you get to the top of a roller coaster and you're just about to go over that first giant leap and you lose your knees, you lose your stomach, gravity disappears for a minute and everything kind of just stops. That's how I felt reading the article. So I said, okay, this is what's going on for me. Now, how do I figure out if I'm right? Well, the only person that knew me well enough to know that was my mom, but I didn't want a biased opinion because I'm a science person by nature. So I said, okay, I'm going to send her, I'm going to email her the link and I'm not going to say anything. So I did. And mom's being moms. She checked her email like three days later or something like that. But she read it and she walked into my room and she said, okay, where do you want to go to get, it, get this taken care of? This is it. You found it. You found your people. Wow. And I said, okay. Well, this is going to be a big deal. Let's go do it right. Well, you know, I, this is such music to my ears because it makes our team here feel very good about what we're doing for all these different brains yep. because they all overlap and we want people to have that aha moment where I'm watching Becca Laurie. That's my story. That's me or that's partially me as opposed to I'm the only one in the world who thinks like this or feels like And it like is. This. It's extremely isolating when, I, I mean, I'm not a fan of labels. I poo-poo them all the time. But also not having a community, a sense of community, that there are other people like you is extremely isolating, very lonely. And it's also kind of scary to think that there's something just so rare about you that 
you can't function in the world. Tell us about the transition to being with GRASP. Okay. Uh, well, I had um, gotten my diagnosis. I was 35 when I read about it. and my, It was right at my birthday, literally. And I, my mom said, do you want to do it after your birthday? I'd always struggled with birthdays. They're a social occasion. You're the center of attention. I was never happy. So I said, birthdays are already hard. Let me wait till after my birthday. So I went and it takes a proper diagnosis and evaluation takes, should take six to eight weeks. There's multiple sessions, especially for adults. Our parents have to come in and give a history. So it took a while to get it. And in the meantime, I was reading Leanne Holiday Wiley's book, Pretending to be Normal, which remains to be, to me, the most well-written book for females who are looking to get a diagnosis or understand what it is to be on the spectrum. And it was her story of walking through the whole procedure. And she also got diagnosed as an adult. So it was really like reading my own story. And I it was my first way of having a vocabulary. I didn't have the words to explain what was happening to me. I didn't have the words to explain what I was struggling with. They literally could not describe it to another person. So she gave me my vocabulary and gave me confidence that I was doing the right thing. And I was reading it in accordance with my evaluation as I was going through my evaluation. Um, came to the end of it, got all the paperwork and the testing stuff, and that was done. Um, and it was clear. There was no question. I was not sitting on some kind of cusp of anything. And um, I walked out and my mom said, well, how do you feel? And smartly so, because I was sitting suicidal. It could have taken me either way. And I said, well, I feel fantastic. I want to tell everybody. I'm so relieved and entirely relieved that I belong to a group and I'm not broken. It's that my brain works differently and I it's so great. So I took that first year and I followed their protocol, which was they had given me some book recommendations. They gave me a therapist. They um, you know, gave me some things that I should be doing, organizations I should get involved in, one of, one of which was GRASP um, at the time. And... I kind of just said, okay, well, I'm going to work on me for a year then. I've been laying in bed. I might as well just not lay in bed because I have two choices at this point. It's a lifetime diagnosis. And I could say, well, screw that. It's never going to get better. And I give up entirely and not do anything, which a lot of people do do. Uh, or I, I can try and see if I can make things better for myself. And then if that doesn't work, then I can say, screw it and forget it. I'm going to have it forever, which seemed more logical to me. <laughs> So I worked my behind off for a year straight, going to therapy every week and work reading and working on everything in between there, changing my diet, all kinds of things. And a year after that, I was feeling entirely grateful to the people who had, in my opinion, saved my life. I was grateful to the people who did my evaluation, my diagnosis, the organizations that have provided me support. And I said, you know what, I want to start volunteering places. Um, and I really will give AHA some credit they were the one of the places that was closest to me um, and full of resources. And I did say, you know, can I volunteer with you? And I worked there for a few years. What um, place I, was that? Say that again. AHA. Uh, it's the, I think it's now stands for um, Asperger's and High Functioning Association of some sort. I think that's what the letters stand for now. Um, but it was a place to start, a place to give back, because if it wasn't for getting diagnosed, I wouldn't be there. So I decided to give back my time. And I didn't care what I was doing, if I was mailing envelopes, whatever, don't care. Didn't want there to be another me. That became my cause. There should never be another 36-year-old woman who's lived her entire life suffering, coping, and then not getting anywhere. So I started on that path. Um, I became a heavy reader. I read Asper Tools when I came out <laughs> right away. Um, and uh, I was really, that was sort of my place there. And then I felt like, you know, I've done enough here. I really want, and I'm comfortable with my diagnosis enough, and I'm comfortable with my life enough. I'd like to see where I can take it because I really believe this is going to be my first chance to have a career. I want anyone who's taking this information in to know how to find you and where they can learn more. You can go to www.grasp.org. You can reach us at info at grasp.org. And if you're looking for me personally, you can find me on Facebook. It's Becca 
Lori, L-O-R-Y, and it's really me, I promise. <laughs> well, Becca, Lori, the leader of GRASP, it has been an honor and a privilege and a lot of fun to have you here today on Exploring Different Brains. Thank you, I had fun as well, it was very much fun. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.